So open your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9 and 10. Those of you joining online this cold, brisk Super Bowl Sunday, um, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, let us know you're there. Um, that's always encouraging to us. We don't, um, we, we don't think of you guys as a sidebar. We know that uh, things the way they are, that it's just a, the nature of this whole situation that we're in that many of you can't attend. And so we want to encourage you in the Lord, let you know that we pray for you, we think about you often, and we love to see you interacting and fellowshipping even with one another online. And so uh, here we are today in Zechariah chapter 9, and if there ever was a Super Bowl Sunday sermon, I got it for you today. I think today, man, like, if you, like you're going to want to shout at different points in time. It certainly has been incredibly encouraging to me, and I think it will be to you, because today we begin the second division of Zechariah. And when you get to the second division of Zechariah, you're looking at uh, chapters 9, 10, 9 through 14, and what we have in those chapters is we have two oracles that are given to Zechariah. Most scholars agree that um, they believe that these were probably um, written like later in Zechariah's life. And they're also a lot different um, in the tone and in the, the sort of the, the style. They're a lot different than what we have been studying up to this point. And so up to this point, the prophet... Um, um, he, what he was doing was foretelling the immediate future of the Israelites as they made this journey from Babylonian captivity. They had been carried away. This uh, decree had been issued by Cyrus. They were allowed to come back. And so a group of them, about 50,000 um, Jewish people, made the pilgrimage and went back to their homeland, found it in ruins and started the, the rebuilding of the city and starting with the temple. And so that's what we've been learning about. And the, and the prophecies dealt with encouragements about things that were going to happen for them in their immediate future. And then sprinkled along the way, we had things, um, we had messianic prophecies. Sometimes we would see a picture of Jesus in some of those prophecies. So they had uh, immediate a blessing for, for the people in ways, but they also had future implications of the, the coming of Christ. And there were prophecies sprinkled in there about the, the church, how the church would come in and, and the, the, the Gentiles, people who were not Jewish, would be included in on the kingdom of God. But now we have a major shift, and what we see is... Uh, in this, like chapters 9 through 14, is incomparable prophetic truth about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so, like, man, I, I, I have never, I've never had the freedom um, from the Lord to preach on prophetic things. And he sort of, in the last year or so, is leading me on this journey. And, and probably today is probably the most prophetic sermon I've ever preached in my life. And by prophetic, I don't mean I'm I'm prophesying, I'm saying I'm interpreting a prophecy from Scripture. And it is absolutely um, incredible, and it's, it like bolsters your faith, it encourages you, um, and, and like when, you, it's, and when you're in seasons of doubt, when you think about things like this, and you learn things about like this that I'm going to teach you today, it, it is like... Man, it gives you confidence in your faith. And it's not surprising because John, um, the Apostle John, we call him John the Revelator because he wrote the book of Revelation, and he had a lot of visions that are similar to Zacharias. Um, and, and so in chapter 19, verse 10, um, right before verse 10, like the angel uh, uh, is like giving him a lot of instruction, man, and he's so overwhelmed by the glory of the angel that he falls down to worship the angel, and the angel tells him, don't. He's like, get up, bro. He's like, man, I'm, I'm a servant like you. He's like, we worship God. And he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so that word testimony in the Greek, it can mean evidence. Like, and so the Jesus is the evidence for prophecy prophecy being fulfilled. And so it tells us that, man, when we look at pro the, the prophecy of the Bible, we're blown away by the power and hand and, and sovereignty of God over people and nations. People even that don't believe in him, as we learned a few weeks ago, he controls nations. 
And so the, the nations all over the world, man, even though they may be rebellious and, and, and pagan and unbelief when it comes to the things of God, they, God will use people like that to bring about his will on the planet. And so as we jump in today, we start in verses 1 through 8, and, and basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through um, uh, cha- different verses, and when, the, here in the front half, like there will only be about uh, 10 verses, and they'll be a little slow, and then I will expound verse by verse on uh, through uh, verse 11 all the way through chapter 10. And so here, let's just jump in verses 1 through 8. And see what's going on and see what the Lord has for us. He says, the word of the Lord is against the land of Hadrach and will rest upon Damascus. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. So he says, the prophet says, man, that, like the eyes of all men and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, all the tribes of Israel, they are on the Lord. And he says, and upon Hamath too, which borders on it, and upon Tyre and Sidon, um, though they are very skillful, Tyre has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. But the Lord will take away her possessions and destroy her power on the sea, and she will be consumed by fire. Ashkelon will uh, see it in fear. Gaza will writhe in agony, and Ekron too, for her hope will wither. Gaza will lose her king, and Ashkelon will be deserted. Foreigners will occupy Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Now the Philistines, they have been enemies of the Jews like forever. Like you remember, Goliath was a Philistine and they came out against the Israelites and David slew the Philistine. And they always like had, they, they were ungodly people. They were very pagan. And he, so he says, um, I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take the blood from their mouths, the forbidden food from between their teeth. Because they were involved in this like really weird pagan stuff. And he says, I will remove that, that pagan religion from them. And those who are left, listen to what it says. Those who are left will, be, will belong to our God and become leaders in Judah. And Ekron will be like the Jebusites. Now, the Jebusites were the people who lived in the area of Jerusalem as David conquered it for the first time. And the, it became uh, the capital city of Israel. And as he conquered it, he did not, like, they didn't destroy all the Jebusites. They were allowed to live and they got assimilated into the nation of Israel and they became um, uh, uh, Jewish in their religion. They started following the monotheistic God that, that the Jews believed in. And so he says that of, Phil, of the Philistines. And what that tells us, man, is, is it like there's hope for anybody. If there's hope for a Philistine, there's hope for anybody, right? It's like it doesn't matter how far gone a person is. It doesn't matter how sinful they are and how evil they are. There is room in the kingdom of God for them when they discover who Jesus is. And he says, but... And so all of this up to this point has been about all these surrounding nations. And he says, but I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an, uh, an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Okay, so here's, here's the first takeaway for you today. The king's eye is on me. And, and today's sermon is called The Tale of Two Kings. And the first thing you need to understand what God is saying to us um, through the prophet Zechariah in verses 1 through 8 is, is the, the eye of uh, uh, the king's eye is on me. Now, the prophecy, this is prophecy regarding uh, the, the fall of Israel's surrounding enemies. So verses 1 through 7 are all about these enemies that lived around them. And, and through the prophet Zechariah, God is telling them that these enemies are all going to fall. And in the midst of them falling... He says, I will protect Israel. In the midst of all the destruction that you're going to see happening all around you, I'm going to protect you 
right in the midst of that. And this was very important because the Israelites, as we've noted, they are coming back from captivity from Babylon, so they don't have any, any form of uh, protection. They still had yet to uh, even build the wall. Nehemiah would come later after the temple was complete, and he would be called of God to build the wall around the city. And they were reestablishing the city uh, or the nation of, of Israel, and so they didn't have uh, any defense. And God says to them, I will defend you in the midst of all of these nations around you being destroyed. And so verse 1 says, the eyes of all men are on the Lord. Now, here's what that means. It's, it's, this, this was difficult for me to kind of wrap my mind around at first, but as I continued to do the hard work of digging, I finally uh, understood what is being said here, um, is that God is saying, that there will be a conqueror who, conqueror who comes. And as he goes on his conquest, everybody will be watching him. But they're not really watching him. They're watching me because I'm controlling him. And so as we, as we understand that's what's being said in verse 1, history shows us the agent of judgment was Alexander the Great. And so Alexander the Great comes and he goes on a military campaign and he starts invading um, in this area. And what we, what we see is he takes over and all of these surrounding cities fall. And of special note that we'll spend some time on is this city of Tyre, when it says in verse 3, has built herself a stronghold. She has heaped up silver like dust and gold like the dirt of the streets. But the Lord will take away her possessions." And so the city of Tyre had, um, they had off of their coast, there was an island. And they had, what they had done is they had gone out and they had built a wall completely around this island. And it was a 150 foot wall and it was a double wall and it, it gave them incredible protection because they have water all around them. And so there were different periods of time where they're, they're, they had been under siege. An enemy nation had come against them. And I think at one point in time, they withstood a 40-year siege that, that that enemy finally gave up. They couldn't break in. At another time, they withstood a 13-year siege. They, they, the enemy couldn't break in. And so when God says of them, um, they, they, they've built themselves a fortress um, out on the sea, and it talks about their seas, that's what is being talked about here. Well, Alexander the Great shows up, and when he invades this city, um, what he does is he takes the, the old city that, was on, that, like a, that wasn't out a part of the island, and he uses all of the material that's left from that city, and he wipes it clean, and he builds a causeway out to the island. And he begins to attack the island, and in seven months, he is able to conquer the city. And so while he's conquering that city and he has it under siege, he sends word to Jadus, the high priest at Jerusalem, to send some supplies and some provisions for his men. And Jadus, the high priest, had been in a, he had taken an oath to never take up arms against Darius the king. And so he sends word back to Alexander the Great and says, I'm under oath that I will not take arms uh, against Darius the king. And this infuriates Alexander the Great. And so Alexander the Great sends a letter back to Jadus, and he communicates to him that he will be on his way to take out Jerusalem, and he will sh use them to teach all men who their oaths should be made to. So as Alexander the Great is on his um, military crusade, and he's conquering all of these areas, what happens is when he's finished with um, uh, Tyre and he finally is able to um, secure that, that, that city and take it, take it over, he moves on to Gaza. It takes him seven months there. He moves on to Gaza. It takes him two months there. And then he starts making his way to Jerusalem. As he's making his way to Jerusalem, Jadis the high priest is like he's terrified because he knows he has no way to defend himself against um, Alexander the Great. And so he calls on the people, and, and this is recorded not in the Bible, this is recorded by the um, historian, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. And so Josephus writes about this, and he, he says that Jadus called all of the people, all of the Jews, to consecrate themselves and sacrifice to the Lord and, and pray to God. And so they do. And in the middle of the night, Jadis has a, a, a dream. 
uh, an oracular dream where he receives a, a word from God and, and God tells him to adorn the city in wreaths and to have all the people dress in white and he is to put on um, the, the, what the law prescribed for the high priest to wear, which was this, uh, um, you could read about it in the book of uh, uh, Leviticus when it gives us the, the law, and it's this robe, and it, it, it's adorned in blue, and it has, he has a miter on, 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 and on that miter there's a, a plate, a metal plate, and the name of the Lord is inscribed on that plate. And, the, and lo, the Lord tells him in this dream that he is to go out with the people when, when Alexander the Great comes and meet him and greet him. And so Alexander the Great is on his way to conquer Jerusalem and teach them a lesson. And as he approaches, then Jadis sees them in a distance and leads the people out of the city to welcome him. And so here is Alexander the Great, and there are some other uh, 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 foreign nations that have joined him because they believe when they go into Jerusalem that he's going to be good to them and all the spoils of Jerusalem are going to be given to them. And so as they're making their way, Jadis the high priest, he comes out with the people, and Alexander the Great stops his troops, and he goes out to meet the high priest by himself. And when he gets before the high High priest, he bows down and begins to worship him. And his officers think that he's lost his mind. They think he's gone completely insane. And so um, they go back and, and, and he asked them, the, one of his officers, I believe it was Ptolemus, asked him, what in the world were you doing? Why You always have men bow down and worship you. Why are you bowing down to worship him? And he says, it wasn't him that I was worshiping. It was the God whom he serves as priest. When I was back in Macedonia thinking about how I would become the master of all of Asia, God gave me a dream, and, or I had a dream, and I saw that figure dressed like that man right there, and I believe I'm on a divine mission, and I believe I will be able to conquer all that I've set out to conquer. So he goes into the city with the high priest. They go into the temple, and Alexander the Great, who was on his way to destroy Jerusalem and take them over and teach them a lesson, is now in the temple under the leadership of the high priest offering a sacrifice to God. They open up the book of Daniel and the book of Daniel and they read from the book of Daniel about how a Greek would go on to conquer, uh, I, I believe it was Damascus, and he believed upon that reading that it was him. And then he asked them, is there anything you would like? Are there any gifts that you would like? And they said, yes, please let us uh, continue to worship the Lord our God and let us be free of the seven-year tribute. And also let those in surrounding areas in Babylon, those that are still, our people that are still living there, that they would be able to do that as well and, and, and let them be free of the tribute. And, and Alexander the Great grants it to them. <laughs> and so we're like, look at that. Like you, can, you can Google Alexander the Great's Causeway, the Great's Causeway and it will pop up. It's still there. Scientists had recently, they, I read an article about this. They were trying to discover how in the world was he able to build a causeway when nobody else could uh, take that city over. And they had discovered that by nature, the waves of the sea has created a sandbar just prior to him arriving. And that teaches us that he is the God of the wind and the sea. And see, he made a way. And so we look at all of this, and he says on, in verse 8, but in all of this stuff that is happening, the eyes of men will literally be on me. So he's saying, as you're watching Alexander the Great, you will be watching my hand move about. And in the midst of that, he says, I will keep my watch over you, and you will be protected. And so that teaches us, very importantly, is that God has his eye on us. I mean, look at that, and we go, so this happened 100 and some odd years. I think it was like 150 years, somewhere in that neighborhood, after this was prophesied. No doubt that there's some legend around that, that story, probably, that crept in from Josephus. But we cannot deny the fact that Alexander the Great, was on his way to destroy Jerusalem. He destroyed all of these other countries and, and, and captured them and took them over and made many of the people slaves. He visited Jerusalem 
And he did not destroy and do to them the thing that he did to all of these other countries. And we look at that and we say, man, the Lord, like prophecy is the testimony. The, spirit of, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so when we see God working and prophesying and making prophecies about the future and they actually come to pass, man, it's like, geez, like what does that do for my faith? We say we believe in an unseen God, but he leaves evidence everywhere that he is in fact, alive and well. And that's why he chose um, Israel. He chose Abraham. He made a nation. He made a promise because he was going to talk to all of humanity about who he was through one people group. And so we can look through the history of Israel and how God has interacted with them. And we learn about the one true God that exists. There is not another God on the face of the planet that is worshiped that has the evidence that our God has. That's why we can be so confident in our faith as Christians. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father except by me. And so we look at that, we go, man, the eye of the king is on me. And as I walk through life, and, and as he teaches me and how he protects Israel, the thing that we know about the church is we are spiritual Israel. And so in the church age, we become the kingdom of God. During the monarchy in the Old Testament, Israel was the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is all over the planet and it has been opened up to the Gentile and the Gentile has been grafted in. And so as we trust in the Lord for salvation, um, we are spiritual Israel. And the lesson for that in, in the, the eye of the king is upon me is that Man, God, he protects me. He knows what's going on. He even knows what's going on in the evil that is around me. And God is in control sovereignly of all the events of men. Here's the second thing as we jump into verses 9 and 10. This is very interesting. Verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from, um, from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay, so here's the deal is that verse 10 is all about peace. And taking away all of these things of war. He takes away the chariot. He takes away the weapons of war. And, and verse 9 is a lot different than that. And so what we have here is these verses are not in chronological order. As we study the Bible, the, the, the writers of the Bible don't write a lot like we write our history books. We have to remember it is not a history book. It is a book about the love of God for all humanity. And it contains history, but it is not a history book. It is a theology book. It is about God, and it is his word to us. And so it is not written in chronological order. It is written in theological order. What does that mean? It means as God wants it to be written in the order of the things of God. When we look at verse 9, what we have and 10, are these are prophecies about the first and second coming of Christ. Verse, um, the, the first prophecy in verse 9 says... Shout, daughter of, Z of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous. And what does he have? Salvation. He's gentle and he's riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so in the first prophetic utterance about the coming of Christ, be reminded that we are looking back on this event. Israel, when they received the word from God, was looking forward on it. This did not happen. And so they are looking forward to a prophetic utterance of what would happen and what God is saying to them. And this first king comes in humility. He is gentle. He is righteous. And he brings salvation with him. In the second um, uh, coming, in verse 10, he's completely different. He is coming to bring peace to the entire world. And it says that he will rule all over the entire planet. And so what we have is if you want to, if you're taking notes and you like to write in your Bible, this is very interesting. You can write right between verses 9 and 10, church age. That's what we're living in right now. Right now, all of the church age happens between what has been prophesied in verse 9 and verse 10. And so the, the, the um, first prophecy has been fulfilled. Like salvation is here. 
I think there's a song we, we, we sing, and it says that salvation is here. And, and so we look over in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Turn over there with me. In John, chapter 12, John is one of Jesus' best friends, okay? We, all, we know him as the Apostle John, but sometimes that really makes him sound really spiritual and otherworldly when we describe the apostles that way. But John was a guy just like you and I. He just lived in a period of the time of Christ. And he became best friends of Christ because Christ called them to follow him. And so as he's following, he, he says that he writes his gospel that we may believe. And notice what he writes over here, uh, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 12. He says, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey, donkey, and he sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, this is the important part. Look, look at what John writes. At first, his disciples, which would be he, he'd be like, at first... We did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. What's John saying? John is saying, man, Jesus told us that the Holy Spirit would come. We were freaked out before the Holy Spirit came. There we were in the upper room one day. Man, we're in hiding. We think they're going to do to us the same thing that they did to Jesus. And all of a sudden, man, you know the story. The Holy Spirit breaks out, and we received the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised would come. We went out into the streets, and Peter started preaching, and 3,000 people got what? Saved. What does that king bring? Salvation. They got saved. They believed in the, uh, the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And so what they did as they went in on in time is they, they started to study the Old Testament Scriptures. And they spent a, an incredible amount of time in these minor prophets that we've been studying. And can you imagine the eyes or the mind of John, man? He's, he's flipping through Zechariah and he's reading and then it says, Behold, Israel, daughter of Israel. Now, you have to understand John and these dudes were fishermen, okay? So they didn't, they didn't know all of these things like everybody else would have. They were common men. And he's reading down through there, and he says, Behold, daughter of Jerusalem, your king comes riding on a donkey. And he's like, Peter, you're not going to believe what I just found in Zechariah. We did that. I saw Jesus do that. He said, I didn't even realize what was happening when it happened. And that's the thing that we all celebrate every spring called Palm Sunday, that Jesus rides into town. It was prophesied 500 years before Jesus was even born that it would happen. And Jesus just so happens to find a donkey and ride into town and get everybody to say, Hosanna to the king, Hosanna to the king, when all of the religious leaders didn't want that to to happen. It happened. Why did it happen? Because God controls the affairs of men, and God was riding on that donkey. That's why it happened. And so I look at that, I'm like, whoa, man. And so salvation is here. Now, the second coming has not happened. So if we go to Acts chapter 1, um, verses uh, 11, or 9 and 11, we find this. Jesus interacted with them in the resurrected form. So after he was crucified, he rose from the dead, and he interacted with the disciple for a period of, uh, of days. And he appeared to multiple people, and he continued to instruct them, and he would come and go with them. And on the last time that he came in his resurrected form, he gave them, he tells them, he said, in, in verse 7, he tells them, or, or verse 8, he says, The Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they're just standing, like, could you imagine, like, there, Jesus says this, like, the power of God is going to come all over you. And as he's talking, man, he's, like, making his grand exit, and he begins to rise from the planet. Okay? And they're watching him, and they're stunned, like, they, they're seeing the miraculous, and they're standing there, and they're just looking up into the sky, speechless, just like a space shuttle would just continue to go, and then it disappears. And as they're standing there looking, Luke tells us, they were looking intently up into the sky. 
as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. That has not happened yet. And so now, just like Israel, um, uh, 500 years before the time of Christ, was hearing the prophecy about him coming on the donkey, that has happened. We look back on that, but we are in Israel's position right now looking forward to him returning the second time. And we know from the book of Revelation that when he comes the second time, he's not riding on a, uh, on a donkey, he's riding on a white horse. Okay? And so, he, so, we, so he's like, the, the angels are like, what are you dudes doing standing here? It's time to go to work and go make disciples that make disciples because the dude you just watched leave is coming back in the future. All right? And so we look at this and we go, man, uh, the king is not what I would expect. He's not what I would expect. That's why so many of the Jewish people missed him. Partly, it's because that's not what they were expecting. They clung to the prophecies about Jesus that were about his second coming. And they missed the, hum uh, the humble servant and the suffering servant prophecies about Jesus that were about his first coming. They also rejected him because it was necessary for them to reject him so that he could be sacrificed and that he could bring salvation as he rode on that donkey and he would humiliate the enemy by setting the captive free. Okay, so here's what we got. We got the king's eye is on me. The king is not what I would expect. And then we get to verse 11, all the way through the end of chapter 10. And, and what we find here is that the king is my shepherd. Okay? So now Zechariah gets a vision. Now, you, again, you have to understand, God is not interacting with the people like this the way that he is now. And he gets a vision of when the king comes, O daughter of Zion, riding on a donkey, bringing, uh, 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 bringing righteousness and bringing salvation. He's humble. He's gentle. <laughs> Think of all the things that Jesus said. Those of you who are, are weak and heavy laden, come unto me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Okay? So he's, he's saying, like, when he comes riding on that donkey, now we pick up in verses 11 and following and says, it teaches us this is how this king will function like a shepherd. Now, a shepherd king is what all kings ascribe to. That's what they all wanted to be. They wanted to be the kind of king that people would look to them and think of them as their provider, as their protector. But no king has ever been able to do it because they're all fallen. They're selfish in their nature, in their sinful nature at the root of the, the core of who they are. Even if they are redeemed, they still struggle um, with their own selfish desires and they cannot lead like a shepherd king. But this king, Jesus he fulfills all that is, we're about to learn that was said of him hundreds of years before he was born. It teaches us how he will interact and rule his people. And so let's just start. And I'm going to, like, there's a lot here, but it won't take us long, I promise. The king is my shepherd. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Here's what verse 11 teaches us. We are freed from the waterless pit by a blood covenant. What is the waterless pit? The waterless pit is where Joseph's brothers threw him. The waterless pit is a place where no life ever happens. A waterless pit is what they would dig when they were trying to find water and it wouldn't be found and it just became a pit. And a lot of times they would just toss dead people in there or they would just toss people that they wanted to kill in there. And he says, I will free you from the waterless pit pit by a blood covenant. What is the blood covenant? The blood covenant is when Jesus came on the cross of Calvary and he initiated, and we will remember it in communion, he says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Drink this juice and let it be a reminder to you that it is the covenant of blood that will pull you out of the pit. 
And so as we look at how are we in relationship with the God of the universe, well, hundreds of years before Jesus even died, God said that the people would be freed from the pit where there is no life. I will take them from the pit and I will free them based on the blood covenant. And so that empty pit that has death in it, that has no life in it, the water of God, the eternal water of God is poured into it and it is transformed into a place of life. That's why Jesus says, if you drink from the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. The water that I give you will spring up from within you. As you could not read, you could not believe the Bible if you want to, but I'm like, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, man, how could you deny the God of the Bible? The, you, like, there is no way you could get this many men to come together and write a document that has this much harmony. Like, look at Washington. We're all together and they can't get anything done. And yet these men from all different time periods write about this stuff, and it has this incredible harmony. And so we see in verse 11, we're freed from the pit by a blood covenant relationship. In verse 12, what happens as a result of that blood covenant relationship? Return to your fortresses, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I'm reminded that Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief cometh not before to steal, to kill, and destroy, and I will give you what? The abundant life. He says, test me and see that if God will not return to you, pressed down, exceedingly great, he will do more than you could ever ask or think. What did he do with the guy that he gave the, ten, the five talents? He doubled it to 10 when he put it to work. The guy that had um, the 10 talents doubled it to 20. And the guy that didn't have anything, we know that he suffered loss because judgment fell upon him because he did not believe that the Lord would use him to do the very thing the Lord asked him to do. And so we see here, man, that, that we enter into the abundant life as a result of the, uh, the, the blood covenant that we're in. That's what the shepherd king would do when he came. And then, and then we are reminded, and so, so here's what you have to understand. I don't want to confuse you. For, for us spiritually, these things happen upon the fulfillment of the blood covenant relationship. So when I get saved... I enter into a blood covenant based upon the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary with Christ. So now I am in a covenant relationship with God. All of my identity comes from who I am in Christ based upon that blood covenant. So spiritually, all of this is available to me now. That's why Paul says that all of our blessings are with Jesus in heavenly places. Because spiritual Israel can access the promises of God spiritually during the church age between verses 9 and 10, we have access to all the promises of God. They are yes and amen. That's what Peter says to us. All the precious promises are yes and amen. And so in the future, physically, they will be fulfilled. And so there's, there's kind of a dual thing going on here that one, Jesus comes in the first time and his kingdom becomes spiritual as the blood covenant is initiated. When he comes back the second time, he comes back in his resurrected body in his glorified state and all the saints of the Lord that have gone on before throughout time that know him because of the blood covenant relationship they are in, they are raised to life to reign with him for eternity. Okay, And so there is a physical fulfillment that happens as well. The spiritual fulfillment happens during the church age that we are living in right now through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's important to, uh, to separate because some of these things we will look at and we'll go, this hasn't happened yet. This is available right now. So we move on to verse 13. What happens in verse 13? I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim, which basically is bow and arrow. Amen, bow hunters? Yeah. Amen. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. What is, it, what is that teaching us? That when we enter the blood covenant and we're walking into the abundant life, we are described as weapons in his hand. And so we enter into spiritual battle as a weapon of the Lord. And so our lives are no longer about us, they are about the Lord, because now we are his weapons that are used during the period of the church age to go out and do what? To conquer people and make disciples that make disciples of all nations. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south. 
In verse 14, we find that the trumpet sounds according to his timetable. We learned a few weeks ago that God owns TikTok. It's his timetable. If we turn to Matthew chapter 24, which I'm not going to have you do right now, we find the incredible passage called the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is about Jesus prophesying about what will happen in the future when he comes the second time. And he says, when the Son of Man comes, it will be just as the lightning strikes in the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And the angels... He later says, about three verses later, the angels will sound the trumpet and God will gather his elect unto himself. And so we learn here in verse 14 that the trumpet sounds according to his timetable. We don't know that what, when that time is and it is not for us to know. What it is uh, for us to know is that it's coming and we are to be laborers within the vineyard reaching out as weapons who are represented by the blood covenant and our identity and walking in the abundant life and making disciples that made disciples. I don't think God's called me to make a disciple. What are you talking about? You are a weapon. You are a weapon in the hands of the king who was willing, for those of you who want to say that, he was willing to ride an ass that you might be in blood covenant with him. And he will come back on a white horse. He humiliated himself to turn me into a weapon that I might go forth and, and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when I begin to see this, I begin to go, man, the God of the universe that is given all of this prophecy, he is like behind me and he wants to enable me to do the things that he has called me to do. Verse 15, man, it, it just keeps getting stronger. Verse 15, he says, as the Lord will... Uh, as the Lord Almighty will shield them, they will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be full like a bow you, bowl used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. He shields us and he fills us. He fills us. And so we look at this and what do we say? We are more than overcomers. We walk by the shield of faith. I'm reminded of the scripture that says that we walk in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And he fills us. And, and he says that, um, he goes on to say, as he's filling us in that verse 15, is that they will roar with wine. What in the world does that mean? Well, I'm reminded, I think it's Ephesians 3.28. If, if, forgive me if I'm wrong, but he says, Be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Spirit. And the roar of God will come out of you as you walk in the fullness of the Spirit. God just starts to come out of you, and he uses you. He shields you. He fills you. Verse 16 says, um, the Lord their God will save them on that day. We know that is the day in the future when he returns as the flock of his people. And they will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. They will sparkle in the land like jewels in the crown. Where is the crown war? On the king's head. And what does Paul say to us? That we have the mind of Christ. We have the ability to take every thought captive and judge it in the name of Christ and walk it out in obedience. And we are not ruled by our flesh. We are ruled by thinking right thinking. And truth permeates our lives. And so our minds are captivated by Christ. We are weapons in his hand who walk in, in the abundant life that have been redeemed by the blood covenant. And and as we walk that out, we sparkle in the land. And it gets even better. He goes on in verse 17. He says, how attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young women thrive and new wine the young women. He says we're attractive and we're beautiful. We're radiant like what? The bride of Christ. We just radiate, man. We're walking in the splendor of the Lord and we no longer strive, but we thrive because of the blood covenant that we are walking out in obedience. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 10. Ask the Lord for rain in the, uh, in the springtime. It is the Lord who makes the storm clouds. He gives showers of rain to men and plants a field to everyone. The idols speak deceit. Diviners see visions um, uh, that lie. And, and they tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wander like sheep oppressed for the lack of the shepherd. What does that mean? It means he is the only source of truth. They are looking for all of these different things that will appease their flesh. And the reason they got in trouble in the first place is because of the shepherds, the priests, and the kings who were not following the law of God. And they led them astray into pagan worship. And God says that he is the only source for truth. And sorry shepherds always equal oppression. That's why you always, if the Lord ever calls you to move out 
out of this place, the first thing that you ought to find is not a church that has a great kids ministry, not a church that has a great outreach ministry, not a church that has a great youth ministry, but a church that has a preacher in it that will preach the word of God or you will end up living an oppressed life. Like That's what the Lord calls us to. Verse 3, he says about these shepherds, My anger burns against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders for the Lord Almighty. who He will care for his flock, the house of Judah, and make them like a proud horse in battle. Verse 3 teaches us that the sorry shepherds anger him, and so he shepherds us himself. And he says that he is the good shepherd in John chapter 10, and he transforms us. Did you notice that he transforms us, that as we submit to him like sheep, he makes us invincible war horses? That's what it says, man. I will make them like a proud horse in battle. And so as I learn to walk into the submission of the lordship of Christ as my shepherd king, he transforms me into a war horse. And I'm reminded that therefore those who are in Christ are new creatures. The old is gone. The new has come. Verse 4 says, from Judah will come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler. He is the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, the ruler. The cornerstone we know Peter talks about is that all like he's the chief cornerstone. We are living stones that are laid on that cornerstone who come to life because of the blood covenant and we build the body of Christ. The tent peg, um, there are two renderings for this word tent peg. One is the outside of the tent peg that held the tent uh, uh, erect and then there was an inside tent peg and on that tent peg were hung all the vessels that were uh, fine to the owner of the tent that were used and I'm reminded of Paul telling us that he has vessels that he uses uses in honor and so we hang on the tent peg as tools that he uses as he does his creative and redemptive work all over the planet and so like man it keeps getting it just keeps getting stronger and stronger guys verse five he says together they will be like mighty men trampling the muddy streets in battle because the lord is with them they will fight and overthrow the four horsemen. The infantry will overthrow the horsemen because Israel didn't have horses. And so the infantry overthrows the cavalry. And why do they do it? Because they are walking together with the shepherd king and they become mighty conquerors. The scripture teaches us in the New Testament that we are more than conquerors. Verse 6, he says, um, I will strengthen the house of Judah and save the house of Joseph. I will restore them because why? I have compassion on them. I will be as though I had not rejected them for I am the Lord their God and I will answer them. And so in verse 6, we learn that he strengthens, he restores, and he hears our prayers. He hears us. And Jesus said, knock, seek, and ask and you will find. And he says, man, if we two or more agree on anything on the planet, I will be there in their midst. And so the Lord hears us. Verse 7 goes on and he says, the Ephraimites will become like mighty men and their hearts will be glad as with wine. Their children will see it and be joyful and be joyful and their hearts will rejoice in the Lord. And so verse 7 teaches us is that when our kids watch us live this out, they rejoice and want it too. What's your kid looking at, mom? What's your daughter seeing you? You see, it's not convincing them to get into the baptistry and get baptized. It's not convincing them to say a little prayer. It's convincing them by walking out your obedience to the shepherd king, and they watch what the shepherd king does as he transforms you from a submissive sheep into a battle horse in the midst of the warfare that we're facing, and they desire it themselves because they know my mother is walking in obedience to the God of the universe. She doesn't just talk about the God of the universe. She knows him. She follows him, and my father does the same, and that's the greatest thing you could do for your kids. Kids. Verse 8 says, I will signal for them. I will signal for them and gather them in. Surely I will redeem them. They will be as numerous as before. The word signal is the Hebrew word means hiss. It, it kind of indicates the idea of whistling or playing a flute for the sheep. And they will come. I will signal for them. He signals for us. As his sheep, we hear his signal. Jo Jesus said in John 10, I'm the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They listen and they follow. And he signals for us. Verse 9, though I scatter them among the peoples, 
Yet in distant lands they will remember me. They and their children will survive and they will return. I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them from Gilead and Lebanon and there will not be enough room for them. What does that teach us? We are everywhere. And the longer it goes, the more it grows. The longer it goes in the midst of that church age, the more it grows. And the longer we go and the more obedience we walk out before the Lord, you can't help that the church will just grow because God is pouring out the abundant blessing upon his sheep as they are transformed into battle horses. Verse 11 says, They will pass through the sea of trouble. The surging sea will be subdued and the depths of the Nile will dry up. What does that mean? It means that he helps us in our trouble. God sees us in our trouble. In verse 12, finally, to wrap it up, I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. We know how to walk out our obedience before him. You guys, that's the gospel. That is the gospel written 500 years before Jesus would even be born, as as the Old Testament also prophesies that he would come in the city of Bethlehem. And so we look at that, and what's the big idea? That's my king. <laughs> That's what he looks like. He's a shepherd king. And when we wrap it all up and we try to bring this, like we bring this thing together, what we have is a contrast of two kings. Alexander builds his kingdom by shedding others' blood, but Jesus builds his kingdom by shedding his own blood. Israel is being protected from Alexander the Great, and it is a picture of how the Lord protects us from our surrounding enemies. The song we sing, it says, it may feel like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And so as we're walking with the Lord in this capacity, man, he protects us, he takes care of us, he guides us. And so when we partake of the Lord's communion as we will today and and we partake of that bread and we partake of that, that juice, what are we doing? We're to remember all of this and we're to walk it out in obedience. And then we go to this infamous psalm that I read with you that I hope that it will mean as much to you or more to you than you ever you've heard it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's what he did with Alexander the Great and Jadis. Like they prepared a table and then one who came to destroy walked in to worship with them. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. (laughs) That's your king, guys. Like if that doesn't set you on fire to walk in obedience this week, you don't know Jesus Like when you hear that, man, and you're like, what in the world? Like look at all of this prophetic truth that has been fulfilled. It was five centuries before it would actually be fulfilled that God was talking about it. And it puts me in a place where I'm like, how do I please that God? How do I please a God who would go out of his way to do all of that for me? I just get in a blood covenant relationship with him. And I believe it. And I walk it out. And where he shows me where I'm not walking it out, I'm obedient to him in it. I say, Lord, I want to walk that out. You're my shepherd king, man. You're protecting me. You're providing me. You're giving me a double of everything that I would ever need. You give me all that I need to do what you ask me to do as you send me forth in this church age, preparing for your return. Men of Israel, why do you stand here gawking in the sky? (laughs) He's coming back. He's coming back. He prophesied that he would come the first time, and he did. There is, no, there is no disputing that historical fact. Jesus was alive. It takes faith to step over and believe that he was God. But it takes more faith to believe he was not God. That's what I would submit to you today. And so as you look at that and you go out this week, and you're doing life, man, You see yourself as one who belongs to the shepherd king. 
And you walk that obedience out. And you look for him to protect you from your enemies. You look for him to provide for you the words that you need to speak in the moments that you need to speak. You look for him to cure your anxiety. You look for him to solve your issues because you are going to be allegiant to him. And you begin to seek ye first the kingdom of Christ and all these things shall be added to you. I'm going to ask you to bow in a spirit of prayer. You mean to wrap this thing up, man? If you need to meet the Lord, <laughs> enter the blood covenant with him right there. If you never have, just enter it right now in this moment. But I'm going to pray over communion, and then I'm going to turn the service over to Sean. And I'm going to encourage you to kind of have a moment where you partake of the, 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 the juice and the, and the bread is there in front of you. And like worship with all that in mind, knowing that those two things symbolize the blood covenant. The power is not in the things. The power is in the things to help us remember what they've achieved for us. Holy Spirit, we bow before you and we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord. It is sharp. It is powerful, and it penetrates. It encourages, Lord. It builds us up. And we look at this, and we see who we are in you. We thank you for the blood covenant. We thank you, Christ, that you were willing in humility to ride into town to bring salvation. Let us not take that salvation for granted today, Lord. Let it, let it permeate everything about us. Let it, let it mold us. Let it give us the mind that thinks like you. Give us a heart to consume your word. Do in us, Lord, what we could never do. We love you. We thank you, Lord. And as we enter this final phase of our worship experience together, Jesus, we pray that you'd be honored and you'd be glorified in Christ's name and amen.